psychologist. Uh, she is a chief research officer in the neuropsychiatry department at Fingers here. And she's going to be speaking to us on the important problem of neurocognitive screening in chronic conditions in social Thank you. Um, sorry, I'll be with you in a second. Um, hi, everybody. I'm just going to um, kind of give an overview today of some work that I'm doing, uh, where it's coming from, what, why I think it's important, and so on. So firstly, I'm going to just briefly discuss the role of neurocognitive assessment in occupational health. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about cognition in HIV, diabetes, and hypertension. And then I'll tell you what my study aims are for the study that I'm doing at the moment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the screeners that people are using at this point in time to screen for neurocognitive impairment in occupational settings. Uh, I also just wanted to recognize the NIH and the Fogarty International Center for the grant that I have to be able to do this work. Um, so, the definition of fitness to drive, if we're looking at medical requirements for fitness to drive, the definition of fitness to drive is a driver characteristic or description of a driver uh, defined by the absence of any functional sensory perceptual cognitive or psychomotor deficit or medical condition that significantly impairs an individual's ability to fully control the vehicle while conforming the rules of the road and obeying the traffic laws, or that significantly increases crash risk. And here, the operative word, of course, that we're talking about is looking at the cognitive aspects of this. Um, driving abilities are defined as the sensory, perceptual, cognitive, and psychomotor functions needed to control a motor vehicle in a range of traffic and environmental conditions. So what is the role of the medical professional? Um, basically, they need to provide a recommendation regarding the fitness to drive based on an assessment that they do with a patient or a review of the individual's medical condition or conditions and functional space status with respect to perceptual, cognitive, or psychomotor abilities identified as significant predictors of crash risk. Of crash risk. So just tell me, how many of you are familiar with occupational health assessments for professional drivers? So, so most of you know how it works. Basically, it happens once or twice every year, depending on what kind of vehicle they're driving. Um, a general practice, well, an occupational health practitioner sees them. Um, there doesn't seem to be like a lot of regulation about who can actually see the person. It seems like GPs can also see truck drivers and say that they're fit to drive or not. So that becomes a little bit complicated in terms of in in terms of what is required from the person in their job and what pathologies they're presenting with. So. Um, what, what, what are we concerned about? Disorders that cause sudden disorientation or impairment of consciousness, and this would include things such as uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension, um, so vascular disorders, and also dis disorders that impair thinking, judgment, insight, planning, visual spatial perception, attention, concentration, memory, adaptive strategies, reaction time, and executive function. So these are all the kind of cognitive things that we think about. And in neuropsychology, frequently, the cognitive domains that we would be testing if we're seeing a patient. And they specifically also highlight here that HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders is one of the, I'm not sure, is this the, sh should be one of the, one of the criteria that people are aware of because of the HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders that we find in HIV. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, not, not so many of you know about HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. Have you all heard of it? Okay. Um, I often speak to medical to medical people like GPs who are not aware of it at all. So it's not something that we can yet take for granted that people are aware of and know of. So when people are assessing drivers, and this is just coming back to what I was just saying and about GPs assessing drivers, assessors should be trained to understand, evaluate, and interpret the evidence or outcomes of the assessment objectively against the skills and abilities required for the job and then to justify their decisions. So if we're thinking about neurocognitive impairment, say for example, a person has impairment in, in the verbal domain, there's certainly a, a cognitive impairment, but would that prevent them from driving, for example? And 
The other thing that is really important is to think about stigmatization, particularly in this project where I'm looking at HIV patients as well as um, diabetes and hypertension. We all know that HIV is terribly stigmatized, particularly in the, in the logistics industry. I think it is still quite bad. Um, so we, we need to minimize the opportunity for assessors to make subjective or arbitrary judgments that could deliberately or inadvertently work against the, the work to the advantage of one group over another. Um, so just because somebody's HIV positive, People may think suddenly this person has a higher risk for having for having driving impairment. Mm -hmm. Driving impairment is not associated with HIV. It's associated with HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. You know, it would be similarly for diabetes or any other condition. It is not the condition itself that puts the person at risk. It is whether that person has associated neurocognitive impairment that actually puts them at risk. Um, and it's important, again, to make sure that they assess against competencies for the job. So focus on abilities that are directly relevant to the job, rather than more general cognitive limitations. And of course, then it also mentions um, chronic or relapsing disorders, including HIV. So that's just an overview of what's expected of the, the occupational health provider when they're assessing drivers. So looking at South Africa, we have the largest HIV population in the world. I think all of us know that. Um, we also have the largest antiretroviral treatment, treatment program in the world, which is really great. So one of the things that come with that, and that has come because of the fantastic advances made in medical, medical treatments for people with HIV, is that people basically now live near normal lifespans. People are HIV positive, so they're becoming much older. We're now seeing cohorts of people going into their 50s and 60s who are HIV positive. Um, we do know that HIV affects, um, well, the brain ages prematurely with HIV. So we need to start to understand what is happening to the people who are living with HIV or are getting older. Um, and this also changes. Of course, ARVs affect people differently. If you, if you take ARVs much later and you've had a very low um, CD4 count, you may be more inclined to develop in your cognitive disorders than you may not if you didn't. Education, all of those things affect it. Um, also, it depends on how adherent you are. Um, yeah, so, so there, there, there are many aspects that, that, we, need to, that we need to look at, but, um, you know, in terms of longer life expectancy and so on. We have a massive transport industry and very high traffic-related death rates, so 32 deaths per 100,000 population versus 24 deaths per 100,000 in Africa. So driving really is a concern in South Africa, and um, we need to try to manage that as well as we can. So looking at prevalence in, in, in drivers in terms of these conditions, um, of course drivers are more prone to develop any of these three conditions because they work away from home, they're sitting in trucks, um, they don't get exercise, they don't eat well and so on. So the estimate HIV, it's very difficult to get estimates of the prevalence of drivers in South Africa itself. That information doesn't really seem to be available. Um, so I'm sure that all the companies know this, but it's not something that is actually published very often. So in South Africa, um, or Sub-Saharan Africa, estim the estimates of HIV have been between 26 and 56%, depending on what studies you read and where the, where the studies have been done, which codes of people have been looked at. Um, compared to 1289 like 13% HIV positive rate for men in, sub in South Africa, so it's considerably higher. Um, a hand, the hand estimate, that we, HIV associated neurocognitive disorders estimate, is between 23 to 76% percent, depending on which study you read. Uh, Fanvey um, Fun did a study recently looking at an occupational health cohort and they found a prevalence rate of 32% of hand in that, in that um, cohort. Diabetes... Uh, um, for the army. Uh, diabetes in... Drivers, this is uh, what well, has been reported to be as high as 33% versus 7% um, of the general the general population. So diabetes is much higher in the in the in the driving population than it is in the normal population. Hypertension, a meta-analysis is 23%, so this is from you know studies from across the world. Vitz recently said hypertension in the general population is 42 to 54%. So we would imagine that drivers in South Africa would be more or less the same rate, if not higher. 
And for these, we don't have any any estimates in terms of neurocognitive impairment. Also, with diabetes and hypertension, onset tend to be later in life. So the studies are generally done in cohorts of people older than 60. So we don't really know anything about people who have earlier onset. And for diabetes, for example, onset tends to be 15 years earlier than it would be in developed countries like the United States and the UK. So there's a little bit of a gap in knowledge there that we need to look at. Um, that's going the wrong way. So the cognitive effects. Um, so all of these conditions, all three of these conditions would probably present kind of similar because we're looking at subcortical brain damage. So we are generally going to present rather the way that HIV presents, and I think that we can extrapolate that the other two would present similarly. Um, so we know that cognitive impairment, or when we do cognitive testing, we test for certain cognitive abilities and domains that people require in everyday tasks. It is safe to assume that if a person, for example, on the domain of psychomotor slowing performs poorly in neuropsychological tests, that when they do tasks that require neuropsychological, I mean, psycho, uh, <laughs> psychomotor slowing, that they would perform poorer in that task, right? So, um, one example of this would be a poor reaction time as a result of so psychomotor poor attention in a driver, and how that can significantly increase. In, in, uh, promote collision risk. If a person is two seconds slower to hit the brake when they're driving in a truck going 80 kilometers an hour, they would be 44 meters closer to the object than they would have been if they braked two seconds earlier. So, so these, these kinds <coughs> of um, impairments do actually matter and can make a difference. So for HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, we have three categories. I'm not going to discuss them in depth. I'm just... Um, just, just so that you know, asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, mild neurocognitive disorder, and HIV-associated dementia, which is the worst form. I would be really, really surprised if we find any drivers in our cohort who are going through neuromedicals who have actually who have HIV-associated dementia. Um, but how does how does hand actually affect people in terms of 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 possible work or what we know of previous studies that have been done? So we know it, it decreases quality of life, it increases the risk of mortality, it disrupts activities of daily living, um, it can affect driving ability, it decreases employability and daily functioning, and adherence to medication, which is a really important one. Um, it is associated with poor decision making and greater HIV transmission risk behaviours. Um, people have more frequent biological failure, uh, people have higher mortality rates in those who present with previous mild neurocognitive disorders and it jeopardizes health outcomes. And as I've already mentioned, people who are older than 50 are at increased risk of HIV-associated decline in dementia. And early detection of hand is important for adequate treatment for HIV, for planning, to, um, for, for, planning for present and long-term preventative care in patients and to, to manage comorbid factors that can be associated with HIV and aging. So we need to know this so that we can have adequate planning for future um, health policies for people who live with HIV. Also, we know that HIV affects hands, um, affects employee adversely and may be implicated in early retirement or retrenchment. Um, neuropsychological impairment predicts employability over and above medical symptoms. Those with hand may be up to three times as likely to be unemployed than those without hand. And the rate of unemployment in people with hand is significantly higher than in the non-impaired HIV population. So it's also important to know that hand increases the likelihood of cognitive failure in, the occup in occupational performance. And this is where drivers would be um, really at risk in terms of endangering themselves and also endangering other people on the road. So what have we seen in terms of driving studies that have been done with hand? Um, as we know, it's a complex task. It is dependent on intact perception, attention, tracking, and choice reaction, and sequential movements. One of the reasons why, I mean, when I started to become interested in looking at how people are affected, how vocational function is affected by HIV or other conditions that, that may affect neurocognitive functioning, um, The reason why I became interested in that is because I was working at clinics and none of this was ever addressed with patients at clinics. And when I was speaking at occupational health um, conferences, people would always ask me, what do we do? What does it look like? How do we screen for people? You know, and that was really difficult to answer.
But um, so in terms of driving, a subset of HIV positive people with HIV present with overall impairments in driving. And 29% of people who had HIV who were asked about driving subjectively reported that they felt that their driving was actually worse than it was before. Um, people with HIV were three times more likely to have had a moving violation in the past year. They had a higher crash rate, significantly so, of 33 versus 18%. They also caused more crashes on the driving simulator. Um, they made almost three times the number of navigational errors. And when they did on-road testing with these drivers, they found that they were unsafe at a higher rate of 36 to compared to 6% than drivers who didn't have hand. And on driving simulator testing, it was found that executive function, attention, and speed of processing are mainly associated with driving. If any of you have questions, you must just stop me and ask, okay? Um, so when we look at what we need for driving, really visual attention, divided attention, and processing speed are the three domains that we really want to look at. So visual attention is our ability to select <coughs> what is important. When you're driving, and there's a billboard flashing information view, and there's a cyclist, you know, you need to know where you're gonna put your attention. Um, also, divided attention, our ability to do more than one thing at a time, driving and speaking on the phone, um, eating at the same time, speaking to a passenger and so on. Um, so, people who have impairment in attention and in processing speed would obviously be at greater risk on the road. Um, than people who only have impairments in one domain. So if we look at safe driving, what actually happens? The person has to first sample, you first have to see what the world, what is happening in the world around you, right? So <laughs> visual stimuli at a sensory level, you, you have to see what happens. And for that, obviously, you need good eyesight. Then you have to be able to identify and see what it is. So you're driving, you see there's a kid, there's a dog, there's a ball, there's a Ferrari next to you. You know, you need to be aware of all of this. If a ball runs in front of you, are you going to swerve and hit the Ferrari? <laughs> you know, if a kid runs in front of you, you may do that. You know, so those decisions need to be made. Um, so you need to decide what action you're going to take, and then you have to do it and hope that you're fast enough. If you're the truck driver and you're really slow, you know, you may well hit whatever it is that's in front of you. Also, what is really interesting in terms of, of people who drive um, large, like, Chemical, um, petrochemical trucks, you know what um, like juice does when you walk and you suddenly stop and how easily it spills? Now think about a big truck when somebody's driving and that, that, that big thing is full of liquid. So truck drivers are actually trained not to stop when, stop when something runs in front of them because the risk of accident is so much higher because the whole basically, you know, the, the, the G-forces of the fluid that move around will basically destabilize the truck and cause a much a much larger accident. Um, so people also have to kind of like go against their instincts in terms of driving in, in, in incidences like that. So yes, of course, if you have impairment in being able to sample, to, to see what's happening around you and identify what, what those things are, you have problems. But if you then also have these cognitive issues that go with it, you know, you are really increasing your, your, your ability or your chances of actually having an, an, an accident. So the aims and hypotheses of the project that I'm doing are, I'm not gonna, the hypotheses are there, but don't really pay attention to them. Um, the, is to assess the rates of cognitive dysfunction in professional drivers with HIV, hypertension, and diabetes relative to a group of controls. To determine the impact of reduced cognitive performance on, on a driving simulator and to determine the relationship between cognitive performance, driving simulator performance, and real-world driving. <laughs> it's, at the moment, I don't think in this course of people we'd be able to get past ethics, or we'd have to work very hard to get past ethics to actually get on-road assessments with people to be done. Um, because if you find that somebody has impairments, you can't, you can't enroll somebody into a study saying to them, if we find that you have impairment, you're going to lose your job. Nobody in their right mind will participate in such a study, right? So at this point, I, I don't know if we ever will. In, in the States, similar studies have been done, and they agreed with the transport authorities that no licenses will be removed from people so that they can actually understand what is happening on the road with people. 
but we haven't reached that point here yet, and I don't know if we'll be able to actually do that research here. Um, yeah, another, another option is actually to get metrics, uh, driving metrics from the companies, which everybody now, any of you who have discovery may know, you know, you get that information, tells you whether you're swerving and breaking and all of that stuff. Um, we, we couldn't get permission to do that from employers, but hopefully if we get a larger grant, um, we, we might be able to, for some drivers, actually get metrics data, and we can see how that correlates with neurocognitive testing and with... Um, with, with simulated data. So that may be a way to get around, <coughs> but I don't know, obviously we'll have to <laughs> see what happens in future. Um, so how, who are we recruiting? It's a cross-sectional study. We have spoken to several industry partners about the study. <coughs> Everybody's very excited about it. Um, they agreed to give us access to their drivers. We're not involving the employees in the study though, because we, we, we feel that it's better if they're separate. The employees don't know, we're not giving any information to the police and we don't really want to put the drivers at risk and there's also stigma that we're worried about. So we're recruiting, we're recruiting drivers through the occupational health providers at the clinics. We, we go to the clinic, we tell the drivers about the study. Um, drivers are also informed of the study through pamphlets and through some of the driver trainers at some of the companies that we're recruiting from. So when they arrive at the clinic, they're primed and they know that the study is happening. Um, then the research assistant recruits them into the study, or um, an occupational health nurse, if we're not at the clinic, an occupational nurse can recruit them into the study and consent them and uh, get them to participate. And then we also give them pamphlets, so if they're interested in the study, they can actually call us and make an appointment with us. Uh, these, we are, at this time, we're getting 80 HIV positive, 25 hypertensive, 25 diabetes, and 50 healthy controls. Um, I just got another grant to actually increase the age of the population. We, we include people 18 to 50 years, but to actually recruit an additional 25 drivers over the age of 50, um, both well, 25 dri dri uh, HIV positive, 25 controls. Um, I'm not going to go over the exclusion criteria and uh, what the participants will have. Um, I'm not going to discuss this in detail. I'm sorry, I don't know. Have I don't have the time. Um, could you? It's fine. Okay. Um, I'm not <coughs> sorry. I'm not. I'm not going to go all over this. You can just kind of cast your eye over to see what we what we're collecting in terms of in in in, in terms of the medical assessment, biomedical data, and um, measures in terms of the research study. For neuropsychological <laughs> assessment, we are assessing seven domains. We're doing a gold standard neuropsychological battery, uh, which had been done in South Africa and several other studies before, so we are satisfied that it's, that it's culturally appropriate and that we don't have problems with language and so on. Um, so we're looking at the verbal, abstraction, perceptual motor, um, speed of processing, learning and memory, and motor domains. We're also doing a test called useful field of view test. So any of you familiar with that? So it's actually, it's a really great test, um, it's a test of attention, and it has been very well correlated with driving performance. And this is actually the test using, if people, if drivers come in and they perform poorly on the useful field of view test, we will sit down with the driver and say, look, this test suggests that you may, that your attention is poor, that you may be at risk when you're driving, you need to start to take precautions. You know, don't, for example, eat or speak on the phone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, while you're driving. So we give them, we, we basically do a short intervention to make the driver aware. We would also suggest to the driver that they go and see the GP to to discuss um, our findings. And with the driver's permission, we'd be prepared to give whatever our neuropsychological findings are of the research, um, that, of the research visit to the doctor. And the doctor can then refer the driver appropriately to either to an OT or to a neuropsychologist or whatever you know may be required that they feel at the time. Um, we obviously also refer drivers who present with depression and so on. So this is our driving simulator, which we we, we did a short little pilot study last year with an honor student. Um, we didn't like the software that we had, so we got new software from STI Sim in the United States. It's now being set up properly and it's working really well. Um, this driving simulator is not only for us, if other people at the university are interested in doing um, research using it, please feel free to contact me. Um, 
So we're doing four scenarios basically on the driving simulator. A challenge drive, which is basically a replicates daily driving. People have to pass cars, um, they have to brake suddenly, they have to do a right turn across traffic, um, they have to merge into a busy highway and cross busy lanes. Um, a multitasking trial where they have an iPad with, with, uh, with circles appearing on it that moves and while you're driving you have to touch the stimulus circle, so the larger circle in the iPad. And that circle becomes, we do three trials, so first it's quite large and then it becomes smaller and smaller, so it becomes difficult. And that's basically just to look at <coughs> the kind of workload that's generated by GPS systems. And then a uh, car following task, it's it's actually quite difficult. The difference, so you, 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 a car's going in front and you following it behind, and there are not large speed differences in the car, but you have to try to kind of keep the same distance behind the car that you're following. And then the divided attention task, where you're driving and then you have to react to stimuli, stimuli that appear on the screen by putting, if there's a right arrow, you put the indicator right, if it's a left arrow, left, and press the hooters. So here's just a little clip which is now not going to, how do I get this to play? Um, mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That's, um, that's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, it says quick time not available. It wants to play with quick time. I'm sorry, I don't think I'm going to be able to play this for you. I can play my laptop, but I don't think you'll we'll be able to see anything. Is it on the internet? Uh, no, it's the well, I have to down I'll have to go into Dropbox and whatever, so it may take it may take a while. But I'll just kind of talk to the screen then. So it's really pretty. So you have these are your these are your stimuli stimuli and the stimulus buttons that you have that change. And then as you drive at some point, you know, as you go in, there's a kid that runs across the road in front of you, there's a car that reverses in front of you. And it's it's quite tricky because you have to pay attention to these and you know and you have to try not to crash into what what, what is actually happening in this very busy little town. So what are the challenges that we're facing? Um, we have very little knowledge about what exactly it is that affects commercial drivers. So studies have been done in lay drivers. But we also thinking that you know, commercial drivers have had driver training. They drive many, many, many hours all the time. So they probably have cognitive reserve, which means that they would, maybe the effects that we see in lay drivers would be less, would be less in commercial, commercial drivers. You know, they, they would have to have more severe impairment before it may actually affect their driving ability. We need to understand these questions, which we don't at the moment. We need to understand which domains are really critical for driving in terms of, in terms of this cohort of people, so that somebody doesn't isn't um, get laid off at work when they're actually still perfectly capable of driving. We like screeners and we like tools. Also, in terms of knowledge, we really, really need to start to educate medical staff in terms of what these conditions are. Is really a massive lack of knowledge in terms of what they are. So we don't have screeners or tools. People, I'm going to discuss screeners and tools in a bit, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much about that now. There are few staff who have been trained to look at this and understand this, whether this be in doing screenings or doing neuromedicals with people to, to check. Of course, time constraints, constraints are always a question. People want to do things in like two minutes. Um, instead of taking 20 minutes. So how do we get an effective screener that can be done by people? Um, and there's a lack of formal guidelines. So when we're looking at screening, oh, so why, why is this work significant? Those are the gaps. What is this work actually answering? This is actually the first research program in the field looking at vocational workers in this context. Everybody just looks at, um, basically when research is done, the people look at people at primary health care clinics. And so frequently, people who participate in these studies, and particularly in HIV, are people who are actually non employed. So, people who are non employed functioning is quite different to people who are employed. Um, you have education differences, um, general functional differences. <laughs> it's a little bit challenging because it's hard to get the drivers to come in. 
difficult, you know, because they're working, but, um, but yeah, so it's, it's important that we, that we understand that. It's the first evidence base rather than any dose report is the impact of neurocognitive impairment on occupational driving performance. Um, it informs occupational health providers with screening and treatment options, and I'm going to discuss that now when I discuss treaters, um, when I discuss screening, how we're going to do that. Um, we're starting to bridge the gap between occupational health and neuropsychology. Um, we're addressing important public health questions related to treatment and public safety, and we really hope that at the end of the day we will be enhancing the quality of life of people living with these conditions. And of course we can inform patient care and employment management. So commonly people tend to use the, when people screen, people use the HIV, the International HIV Dementia Scale. How many of you are familiar with that, with that test? A few of you, not many. Okay, so basically the, the IHDS has three components. Um, you ask people to remember four words that they have to say back to you. Then you do finger tapping and you want to see oh, how many they can do. And then you do um, this Luria, well, it's a little bit different to the actual Luria one, but they, they have to do this sequence with their hand. And this is actually a surprisingly difficult test to interpret for people who can't do it, because people do weird things with it. And you must see how many of those they can do in 10 seconds. So it's, it's actually a really hard test for somebody who's a lay person. It's even hard for people who are trained to do it. But somebody who's a lay person, if you go to a clinic, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to interpret. Um, also, oops, the IHD is, isn't, isn't, um, isn't very good at detecting mild impairment. And what we really want to do is we want to detect people who have mild impairment so that we can intervene, make sure they take the medication, so that that impairment doesn't get worse. So we want to intervene as early as possible, rather than catch them later. Uh, so studies that had been done in South Africa had a sensitivity and specificity for the IHDS at a cutoff of 10 of 45 and 79, or at 11 um, better at 72 and 46. Um, Von Bacon, the occupational, that same cohort I was talk talking about earlier, um, found that at a cut of 10 sensitivity of 76 and specificity of 75% and of 11 of 89 and 43. So, I mean, it's not terrible, but I think that we can do better. The mini mental state exam, many of you, I think more of you may be familiar with that. It's a terrible test for, for people who present with subcortical pathology. It's good for Alzheimer's, good for subcortical pathology. So it's not a test that I would recommend to use in this context with, with these conditions. The Montreal Assessment or the MOCA, do any of you know about that? You know, it's just, the MOCA is quite a nice test, but it hasn't been validated. And the studies that have been done here questioned people for some reason on the MOCA, and I do not understand this, call a rhinoceros a hippopotamus or an elephant. And it looks like a rhinoceros. It's not a question of the drawing being poor. You know, so they, they're cultural issues. <laughs> it's like they're things that you need to look at. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then Nero screen is something that was developed um, by Ruben Robbins, myself, and John Joska, and a, a, a local team of um, developers. It's a tablet-based app. I also have a movie of that, but I'm not going to be able to play it, I'm sorry. Um, basically, this is, when you get to this, when you log in, you get to this app, and we at the moment doing it on a little Android tablet that's about this big, so it's really portable, it's a cheap tablet, um, and it's easy to use. It tells you that, oops, sorry. It tells you patients on the device, and, and okay, that's that's basically where you log in and you go start assessment. You can put in the patient's information, some demographic information. You can see these are the study participants that we've done so far. That's just our practice. Whenever we want to check something, we use that one. Um, so it's uh, it, it consists of eight brief neuropsych tests. It takes about twenty minutes to administer. And it looks at the domains, learning, memory, processing speed, executive function, attention, working memory, and motor speed. So it addresses all the important domains that we want to look at. We have, we've piloted this in uh, at 100 easy closer speaking uh, patients at Town 2 and Musa Monkley Clinic. We've done it in English and CLOSA, so we know that it can be done in both. Lay counsellors. They, they, the lay counselors they administered it really easily. They didn't have problems with it. They liked it. It worked well. It has standardized instructions. 
so the administrators can always know what to do and they will follow it correctly. And then it also has audiovisual instructions, so it shows the person. Oh, <coughs> uh, yeah, now you see, I, I, you can't have the picture, I'm sorry. So it, it actually gives an example of, the, of what the person should do. If the, if the screen is there and the numbers, it says, the little fingers, a little hand shows you, do this, so the person can see and then they do it. So it's quite easy for them to follow. Um, so results can be made available immediately and you can, we, we examine the specificity and, and sensitivity of Nero screen. So sorry that I can't play it. Let's see, I don't know, I suspect this one won't play. I, I, wrong button. No, it also wants quick time. Um, so I'm sorry about that. So we just used, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but we used a global deficit score to assess this. So we had a gold standard Nero side battery and we did Nero screen. And we looked at three different forms of the test where we did, we did all eight tests. Then we used all the tests plus we used some error scores. And then we looked at just a subset of four, of four tests. And we did um, receiver operator characteristic curves on it to see. And we found that in all the tests, we had an AUC of 86, which is, which is pretty good, and high sensitivity and specificity. So I just put these here so that you can compare it to the IHDS. Um, when we looked at all the tests plus the error scores from the trail making task and the number input, um, this actually improved a lot. We had 81 sensitivity and 81 specificity. And this, one may argue if you really want to see whether people have impairments or not, since specificity is a little bit lower, we found that if you used a subset of four tests, you had really the best sensitivity in the tests. Um, this test would also, since it's four tests, it would probably take 10 minutes to do these four tests with people. So it seems like NeuroScreen is acceptable for lay workers, it's acceptable for, um, for patients. We've done, we've, we've done, some analyses looking at, you know, lay, lay counselor acceptance of using it, patient acceptance of using it, and, and this. So it's working well. We haven't tried it in an occupational health setting, but it does, it works in a, in a health clinic. So it has useful characteristics. It may maybe overestimate neurocognitive impairment to a full battery, but it certainly as a screener, it is working very well. So just in conclusion of everything um, that I just discussed now, there's a gap in understanding the effects of neurocognitive impairment associated with chronic conditions and vocational functioning that, um, that we need to address. This is the first study starting to actually address this gap. Um, a neuroscreen that we're testing with is starting to address screening for neurocognitive impairment and the kind of challenges that we are, we are finding. I'm actually looking for a master's student to work with me to look in the occupational health setting to look to do a validation study with NeuroScreen. So if any of you have have students who may be interested in doing that, please let me know. Um, it will basically involve uh, interviewing occupational health providers, interviewing the nurses who would probably be using NeuroScreen, and then doing exit interviews with them after the study about using NeuroScreen, and then obviously validating NeuroScreen against the full battery. So we, we've already started um, doing that. Um, okay. So I'd just like to thank everybody that I've been working with on the study to make it possible. Um, they've been a really, really good team and very supportive. And, uh, <laughs> oh, could you see if you can play those little videos for me, please? I just want to play it as a video. Mm -hmm. Oh, I uploaded the video onto the it's in here and it says it wants good time. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can, I can keep the videos off my machine and I can keep it. It's a compatibility issue with the 64 bit Windows. Um, so if you've got the original video files, that you can Oh, yeah, I think I do. I don't have a.
Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have any any questions? Or suggestions or problems? So uh, did you um, control for whether people or whether people were driving while they're texting or talking? I mean how, did you factor that in, in your assessment or your <sighs> driving while texting and talking on the phone without hands free? Is that at all addressed in your study or um <laughs> Or we we asked back to the provider yeah. about the, your participants. We, we ask people whether they do that. Um, so we just get self report data on that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not assessing that as such as, as an independent thing. The third task, the one on the iPad where it has the numbers, would 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 address how well they would perform if they did right. that. Okay, got it. But um, but yeah, we're not. Mm. We're not doing that specifically. So I also wanted to ask, are you considering the impact of uh, HIV medication on cognition? We are, we are collecting information about the medication oh. that they take. So we're collecting information about all the medications <coughs> that they're taking. So some of them are for somnolence and yeah, like all of focus and concentration. Concentration, all of that. Yeah, we'd, when we analyze the data, we would have to look at that. And then I wanted to ask whether I sensitivity, what is the gold standard also the, the psychological factors? The yes, yeah, for, for John's study, for the study done by John, it was, for the, for the occupational health cohort, I would have to look at that battery again, I read that paper a little while ago, but I think it would have been yes. Yeah. Any other questions? How does the new request assess the noted function on the iPad? Oh, you know, it it has a finger tapping task exactly. where you where you tap the screen and it counts. Yeah, but yeah. Normally, it's assessed by some kind of dexterity function, like yeah. pick or something. So it's yeah. slightly different. Yeah, so it's slightly different. So this is really just, I mean, essentially with NeuroScreen, what we kind of envisioning in the in the long run. Sorry, I'm just looking at the screen while I'm doing this while I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> The, <laughs> the um, sorry, <laughs> what did you ask, please? <laughs> oh yes, uh, what did I want to say to you about this? Oh yes, obviously. So so the, we we just screening for people, can't diagnose people after you did neuro screen, right? So what we're thinking that we're going to do with neuro screen would be. Um, uh, would would be so you can maybe just say it's it's that one. You can just save it onto that memory wow. stick, and then also the um, number where is it now? I'm looking for divided attention in before that one. The last one. No, divided that one there. Easy. So the number repetition and and that one. And that one. You can just save it on this memory stick. It's, um, it should be if you go down. Um, yeah, Sorry, the, uh, there's the transfer. Yeah. Um, so what, we, what we're hoping we'd be able to do with NeuroScreen actually in the long run is once we've assessed it, if we can find even one test that's really sensitive, I'll just start out of my if we can find one test that's really sensitive, you know, you can do that test. If that raises a flag, then it will move on to do one or two more tests. You know, if it raises the flag, then it will do more tests. So obviously, it's really important. You know, everybody goes, "Where's money? Where do we find money to actually do this?" You know, so hopefully, a lot of it you can do like electronically. That will take twenty minutes with a nurse in the clinic, and that will then, you know, only then will the person be referred once, you know, once they've gone through the different phases of it. Um, I mean, we may even at some point develop that it as a full battery. And and then the much shorter assessment will be will be required. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This is not about the study particularly, but, but what happens afterwards. So presumably the, the results will um, one of the recommendations will be policy changes to people entering the industry and, and uh, carrying on in the industry mm -hmm. and then our high unemployment contracts and so on. That's gonna be a real challenge and I'm just wondering mm -hmm. 
how you might uh, deal with uh, labor unions. Oh. And clearly this is an yeah. important area, yeah. but there would probably be some opposition to the policy change. Yeah. Yes, I mean, what, I, I think that really, well, in terms of screening, what you want, to, what I mean, in a perfect world, what would be really great is if a person is employed, so they screen, then you have a baseline performance for them. From then onwards, when they do, the, when they go for the neuromedicals, they can be screened and they'd be compared to themselves, and you'd be able to see whether this person, you know, whether there are any problems that 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 arise. And it's it's a very difficult balance, because one of the things is that we really do not want people to. In, to lose their jobs. I think that that is really important and it's really important that I highlight that. One of the ways to prevent people from losing their jobs is to make sure that you catch these kind of symptoms early. You make sure that you look at what kind of medical treatment they're getting, is it the correct treatment that they need, that you intervene in terms of them being adherent to their medication, um, that they change their lifestyle so that they remain healthy. So, it, it, on the one hand, you can say, yes, people may lose their jobs, and on the other hand, it can actually be really supportive and help people keep their work for much longer and stay employed for much longer and at the same time improve safety. You know? Oh, you can't. Have you not been able to do this? Okay, let me just do this quickly. Um, divided attention. Okay, so just to, I mean, I think one of the things as well is commercial drivers really support travel driving because they have quite small proportions of the driving population. So some of it has to do with, yes, the risk when a tanker goes out of control is very big, but our road traffic fatalities are not that, and most of the people who would be involved in this would be people who are getting, who are, who are going for professional driver's license anyways. But do the drivers have any of the PDP? No. Yeah, I know they don't. The last three. The last three Ubers I had been in were actually drivers who stopped doing it because, you know, it's too lonely, it's terrible, you know, they don't like the work conditions, and they've become Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So Kirsty and I'm thinking of working together to try to put up a cohort of looking either at um, minibus taxi drivers, maybe Uber drivers, but try to, I don't know, you know, try to kind of make some sense of of what is happening and what one can do in terms of providing support. I mean, while you're about that, find out if you have drug resistant TB at the time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I just wanted to ask, yeah. just in terms of hypertension and diabetes, I mean, I worked in a big set of drivers clinic for the city last April last year, and that was the most common reason we failed people and took them off driving because of poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension. Mm -hmm. But one never quite knows. <laughs> so I just, I want to know sort of what the natural literature says. I mean, are they sort of, there, have people done this kind of work among the drivers specifically? Some, not, not local as far as I'm aware. Yeah, no, I don't think there's anything about it. <coughs> um, but I think that people have, there we go. Is this divided attention, number repetition? Sorry, I'm just, um, in terms of diabetes, um, it's mainly older, it's older cohorts rather than the younger cohorts. So it's really, it's a little bit difficult to say because I'm thinking the earlier the onset of diabetes, the bigger your chances that you're going to have kind of neurocognitive fallout later on. Um, the kind of impairments that you see are would be kind of like attentional um, and executive function. So I could see you just recently did a lot of work in that. Um, with hypertension, you know, the literature isn't really that clear. It's also it's also all the populations, but you know, the indications are that it's very similar. I think it would be really great if you could actually test these drivers to see whether they have impairment. Only board them instead of boarding them just because they have the condition. You know, so there's another place where there would be actually where it would be much better in terms of doing this than than go by proxy. You actually know whether there's a risk a risk factor or not.
Yeah. Yeah. Often we are not looking only for neurocognitive problems in those people. We're looking at risk of sudden <coughs> incapacity or cardiovascular risk. Yeah. So, I mean, all the guidelines for drivers around hypertension and diabetes are actually around sudden incapacitation, not mm. cognitive function. You know, because right. it's like one age you know, is a cutoff because your risk of a, right. of a sudden event, a CBA or something, is high, not because of Not because of damage. cognitive. You know, so there's, yeah. a, there's that distinction which is quite difficult. Because mm. there is a, you know, you might have people with very poorly controlled hypertension that you're happy to say, no, right. you can't drive. But then there are people with multiple risk factors if you, if you still struggle to determine their their risk of sudden incapacitation, but we're not really even thinking about their cognitive mm. behavior from those poor, that poor risk factor control. Right. And maybe that would be a different avenue for thinking about their fitness longer term. Or the, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's two yeah. different signs. Like two different things, yeah. yeah. That would be interesting to see how they interact, yeah. what the relationship is between that. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, I have just... Uh, No, no, we, we just started very recently. We, <laughs> oh, right. Yes, no, we just started, um, we just started recently. I'm just sorry, I'm just like trying to find that specific movie and I can't find it. Um, why do you think it's this? It should be this, I think. Um, That's fine. Um, yeah, so recruitment is going slower than we anticipated, obviously, because we, we're having difficulty getting the drivers to come back because they're so often away. But we're now going to start to recruit at three other clinics. So we're going to have Afrox and Parmalat and um, uh, who's the third one? Uh, Transnet also. Um, so, at, so, so at the moment, we're mainly having drivers from... Um, Imperial logistics. So I'm thinking that things will, yeah. So this, I mean, it's. it's I think so many ways. The, the thing is that these companies have very good. You know, they have they have good wellness programs and drivers are well taken care of, but there are all these smaller companies that really don't give a hoot about wellness. You know, and that's really where the problems lie. I think, but so we will just have to see what we can get from you know. So some of some of the at the clinic we're recruiting now. Some of the smaller companies have drivers coming there. So we'll get some of them, and we we asking like who's your employer. So so we'll see. So if you keep your eye on these, you'll see they change. Again, that's the other thing, and the boy walks. Yeah. Now you'll see a car reversing in front of them, and you'll see that. No, 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 it's a normal car. It's based oh, on, a, on, a, on a Volkswagen Polo. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I know. I mean, the, <laughs> <laughs> the complications with trying to actually do, and we do say to the participants when they come in, drive like you would normally drive, you know, when you drive a car. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this next movie is a little bit, um, I see the movie's turn. You can just play it again. <clears throat> The number of the, it's turned. I'm sorry, I don't know how to fix that. Six. Um, Five. Eight. Two. Seven. So if you make an error twice, the the test would automatically stop. The person doesn't have to decide when to stop the test and everything kind of concluded. Yeah. No. Um, I don't know. So what if you just want to comment? 
Well, we're struggling to get HIV positive drivers at the moment. Um, but this clinic where we're recruiting from at the moment, there are a lot of older drivers. There are so many drivers over 50. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, uh, I'm not entirely sure what to make of it. And I'm thinking again that mm, I suspect that many of the drivers with HIV are actually drivers who work with some of the smaller companies rather than the companies that we're looking at at the moment. But I think when we when we start to recruit to the other clinics now, <coughs> we'll see, maybe we'll see more drivers. Or you see some kind of healthy worker effect where mm -hmm. so so or some select themselves yeah. out of the. Yeah, so we try to, for everybody who says no, we try to ask them why they're not participating, why they don't want to participate. Mostly it's been that, you know, they're going to be away for the next three months driving. Um, we've had one HIV positive driver that we know was HIV positive, but that was before we started recruiting, like a week before we started recruiting. So we've seen, we've, we've consented, I think, 18 drivers. So maybe... I mean, if you're looking at what the rate's expected rate should be, we've had one hypertensive, one diabetic out of the ones that we've consented so far. Would you possibly have older drivers because they can't do other physical labor that they might move into the driving occupation because they, the older drivers, yeah. if they physically can't do other work? Quick. No, I think I think with these older drivers, of course, when I was, when I met with Unitrans and Imperial Logistics, they were saying that how extremely valuable these older drivers are to them because they have really good work ethics, they're good drivers, they have good training, so they like keeping the older drivers because they're really good and they really want to be able to keep the older drivers for longer because they're valuable employees. So I think it's that rather than yeah, they just favoured employees. Yeah. Primarily long distance drivers or across all These guys have been primarily long distance, some local drivers, but I'm hoping now that we'll be getting a lot more local drivers when we start working with Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you for coming, everyone. <laughs> I believe you're going to come and sit in some of the DOH lectures. I am. Okay, so you've got yes. the timetable.